have loved you. Now that's a big deal right there. He wants us to love each other as Jesus has loved us. And that's a perfect love. Because the love that we have sometimes, it, it lacks a little bit, doesn't it? I've had you know, people say, I love you, but man, the way they treat you is sometimes pretty bad. Jesus came here to break down the barriers between us. That's Ephesians 2, 14. And he did that. There is no more Gentile and Jew. That we're all what? In Galatians 3, 28 says what? We're all one in who? Jesus Christ. There's no Jew nor Greek. There's no male nor female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. And we're all one in the love of Jesus Christ. Again, in this world today, we say those words. We do say them a lot. But do we really feel them? Do we really understand what the love of Jesus Christ really is? Well, as I was praying on this sermon this week, it hit me about a story that we're going to go to. And it's found in Luke chapter 10. It started with 25 through 37. But before we go into God's holy word, we need to pray. Because we need guidance. Whenever we go into God's holy word, we need some guidance in it. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to see and understand the message that God wants us to have. Sometimes, whether we realize it or not, we have our own personal agendas when we read Scripture. Is that not true? That's why it's so important to pray before we go into God's Word so we don't have a personal agenda. It's natural to have it. We want the Bible to tell us what we want to hear. But what we want to hear is what God's message really is. Now let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for all the wonderful blessings. We thank you for another week. We thank you for, we thank you for the opportunity of salvation. We thank you for your written word, the truth, what we can rely on. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever, just like Jesus. As we go into your holy word, Father, we humbly come and ask that you will guide and direct us. May we hear things according to your will, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. This is not going to be anything unfamiliar to most of you. The story we've talked about many times. But don't ever take for granted Bible literacy. What a gift Bible literacy is. To be able to look at God's Word and have, a, have somewhat of an understanding what He's talking about and the direction He wants us to go in. I say this because I know what it's like not to have Bible literacy. I know what it's like to have it and to think you have it and not even have a clue. What a gift it is. What a gift the Bible is. A little background before we go into this right here that Jesus has sent out 70 disciples. They have gone out and they've done some marvelous things. Some marvelous things. Things that they could not imagine that they were able to ever do. And they were only able to do it. Why? Because the power of Jesus. Not anything they did. It was only through the power of Jesus they were able to accomplish these things when they went out witnessing and sharing the message and healing some sick and helping different individuals. And when they met up with Jesus, they were so happy about it and just telling him over and over all the wonderful things that they had done. And Jesus said, that's all good. But what you really need to be happy about is that your names are written in the book in heaven. Amen. That's what you really need to be happy about. Well, as he's talking with them, he's dialoguing, he's teaching, and he's sharing, a certain lawyer stands up. That's what the, I'm going to say. Well, go ahead. Start with verse 20, um, 10, 27. It says, 25, I mean. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Now, in the New King James, it says certain. Not all, all the um, translations have the word certain. But I think here, when I, when I saw it the first time, I was like, well, he's, there's a lot of jokes about lawyers. You know, and they get a bad rap. And you know, we may even have a lawyer or two in here, and I'm not going to point you out, Amanda. I'm not going to even mention your name. 
but this was just a certain lawyer. This is not all lawyers. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I say? What shall I do to inherit the eternal life? Now, I will say this for that lawyer. He couldn't have asked anybody better than Jesus about the, what do you do to get eternal life. See, Jesus today would be called your SME, your subject matter expert, right? Yeah. He is definitely the one closest to and most knowledgeable about this, about this subject. Because Jesus says, he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father except through me. So if anybody wants to know about eternal life, you need to talk to Jesus. So that lawyer did do one thing really good. He asked the right person the right question. Now this is what the lawyer said. He said to him, this is what Jesus said to the lawyer. He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he turned it right back around to ask the lawyer because he knew the lawyer is an expert in the law. He's an expert in the law. So Jesus turned it right around and asked the lawyer. So, and you know what? When we know an answer, how many of us are so happy to raise our hand and say, oh, we know that. So the lawyer knew that answer, so he was so happy. He was just so ready to give Jesus the answer. He said, so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because, see, this wasn't just said in the New Testament. This was found in Deuteronomy 6, 5 of Levit Leviticus 19, 18. So he was just quoting back Scripture to Jesus. He was so proud of himself because he knew the answer. He knew the answer. And this is what Jesus said. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Now a lot of times we just read that and we move on. Now what, and when Jesus said, when you do this you will live, what did he mean? That you weren't going to die that moment? No. He said, when you do these things, you will have what? Eternal life. He didn't say just one thing. He said two, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. But what else did he say? Let's hear it. What else did he say? And to love your neighbor as thyself. Now, do we struggle with that sometimes? That's what we need to have eternal life. We got to love God and we got to love each other as well. And the devil is working really, really hard. He knows, okay, these guys got a commitment to God, but I think I can work on them really good about this commitment to each other. You know it's true. We know it's true. We struggle with that. You have to love your neighbor. Now look what the lawyer says. Verse 29. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So he wants to justify himself, and this is why. The na that, you can't say that lawyer was a bad guy. You know, he was just going by what he had been taught, but he knew something in his heart. He wanted to justify for himself because he knew the feelings that he has towards a lot of other people. And it wasn't love. So he's asking Jesus, he says, okay, he says, who is my neighbor? Because he's been taught a different way. I want you all to turn with me to Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Just a little bit. Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Peter here has been given a vision. And he saw all these animals come down and he told the Lord, said, you know, and God said, kill and eat. But he said, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. But God had a whole message. We all are familiar with this. He had a whole different message for Peter. And we're going to see it in 28 because Peter believed something different. And God had a big mission, you know, a big plan for Peter, what he needed to accomplish. And it was something he had to get, take care of immediately before Peter could be effective in what he was getting ready to do. Verse 28, y'all follow with me? He said, then he said to them, because he had just been talking to Cornelius, and Cornelius was not a Jew, and he bowed down to him and said, nope, don't do that. And then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Did y'all hear that? Was that just for them then? 
or is it for us right now? There's no Jew nor Greek, no male nor female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. We're all one. And not to call anybody common and unclean. See, the Jews had a terrible time with this. They took this thing about being the chosen ones and it went right to their head. They were chosen to get a message out about God, but they felt, oh, we're chosen, we're special. They were so special by some of them, they didn't even associate with other Jews, much less a sinner, a tax collector, a Samaritan. No. So the lawyer knew in his heart that he had a terrible struggle with who his neighbor is. Because he knows there's a lot of them out there that he didn't love. This is the sad part about it. That lawyer was brought up believing this. And we've got to have a little patience with him because he was brought up believing this. He was brought up in a prejudiced home where he didn't know any better. But there is no excuse, brothers and sisters, with Jesus Christ. He has showed us the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He has showed us that there is equality in us across the board. Across the board. There is no prejudice with Jesus. We're all one in Jesus. We're all one. Back to Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. I'm going to read 29 again. But him wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now Jesus could have gone right ahead and told him and said, Okay, now I know what you guys think. I know what you guys do. He could have called them out right there. But let's be honest with one another. If somebody comes up to us that we particularly don't really care for, and they want to share with us the things that we're getting wrong, we're not doing the way we should do, and they may be right, how, how much are we going to listen to them? We might stand there with a smile on our face, and all we hear is blah, 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 blah. That's it. That's if we can muster a smile. That be we're honest, we know that. For those of us who are married, how easy it is it when a spouse comes up and has you calling you out for something you know you should have done or you didn't get right, and you know they're right. It would be much better if they took the tack that Jesus did and tell a story about it. <laughs> but that's what we're going to talk about. A story. A parable. Because Jesus knew that, hey, if I tell them directly, they're not going to want to listen. So I'm going to give them something to think about. I'm going to give them something to think about. Something for all of us to think about. Then Jesus answered, and I said I'm reading from the New King James because it has this word certain. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Leaving him half dead. Terrible way to be. A terrible way to be. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we feel like we're half dead with all the burdens and the challenges and the decisions that we've made and decisions we wished we hadn't have made. Verse 31. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. I like the word certain again because they're not going to try to say that all priests do this. But this one did. By the way, it, in Desire of Ages, there's a, great, there's a great story about the Good Samaritan. So please read that in Desire of Ages. You get some wonderful information. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now in Hebrews, it tells us that the priests were taught. They were taught the law of God. They were also taught that you're to take care of your flock, to take care of other people. What does he do? Now by chance a certain priest came down from the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. See, that's why you see the topic for the sermon today. You need to be, be a seer and a doer, because he saw, but what did he do? He passed by on the other side. We don't know what was going on in his mind. He might have said, you know what? That might be a Samaritan over there. Or that might be an Ethiopian or someone else. But he's probably unclean and I just don't have time to mess with him. And somehow he justified in his mind why it was all right 
that he stayed on the other side of the road and walked by. But he did it. And I know he did it. You know, how come I know he did it? Because the Holy Spirit speaks to all of us. And he had to have rejected that when the Holy Spirit said, hey, somebody over there in need. Well, no, nope, I ain't got time. Are we capable of doing that? How many times have we been told to call somebody? Or it's something we need to do and all of a sudden we get kind of sidetracked into something else because we didn't really feel like doing it at that time. I'm not calling anybody out other than my own self. Holy Spirit's working on us all the time. He was working on that priest as well, but that priest chose for whatever reason to walk right on. This is a man of God, by the way. And he walked right by someone who's laying over there half dead. You think, how in the world is that possible? Weren't we called by God? Again. But Jesus is laying it down the line. He had an opportunity. He was a seer, but he was not a doer. Now look at this. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. See, the Levite, right here, get the impression that he at least took a second to look and think about it. But he still did the same thing. He probably said, you know what? My wife has got dinner on the table. And I am really hungry. And I know that my team is playing today. And I've been waiting for this all day long. He's probably not one of ours anyway. I don't need to do this. See? This is what Jesus is getting across. He's probably not one of ours anyway. So they rationalized it, and what did he do? He walked on by. He walked on by. Now we get to verse 33. Someone who's supposed to, that the Jews won't even associate with. The chosen ones are the Jews. They know God personally. They're almost exactly like the remnant. Amen. The ones who are supposed to be sharing the message of Jesus Christ with others who are not to have any partiality or any prejudice whatsoever out there to help whoever it is. I hope if any of us remnant hear that, do we remember that we're not only supposed to love God, we're supposed to love our neighbor as well. Now look who comes up. A Samaritan. Someone who is of a mixed race that the Jews won't even associate with. Someone who has got a polluted religion. There's no way this guy can do it. He's got more evil than good. He's not one of us. His religion's not right. What did Jesus say you need? To love God and to love one another. What did this certain Samaritan do? As he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had what? Compassion. Compassion. The others might have walked by, and so I really kind of feel sorry for that guy, but he probably deserved it. I don't know that. I don't, it was not in Scripture. But they, they might have felt sorry for him. But this guy saw him and went over and he had compassion. See, Jesus Christ has compassion. When he saw those who were sick and in need, Jesus, the Bible tells us in Matthew 14, 14, Jesus had compassion. And what did he do? He went over and he healed them. When Jesus saw that we were hungry, when he was feeding the four and five thousand, he said, Jesus had compassion. So what did he do? He went and met their needs. He helped them out. This Samaritan is more like who? Than the priest and the Levite. Jesus. This guy, whether he realized it or not, he actually knows who his neighbor is. And who is that? Whoever it is, is his neighbor. He had compassion. He went over there to the individual. He went over there. And he didn't kneel down and say, Brother, I'm in, a, I'm in a hurry, but I'll at least give you a prayer. You know, like when somebody comes up and they're really hungry and you say, I'll pray for you. Sometimes people, people take advantage of us. But some, and always prayer is good, but not as always prayer enough when somebody is in dire need, in dire need. And this man, Jesus said, was what? Half dead. He needed help, and he needed help right then. 
So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and water him, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Brothers and sisters, there's a whole lot said right there. He bandages his wounds. Jews at that time, if you weren't a Jew, would they touch you at all? Absolutely not. And he only did it for certain Jews. If you didn't live in a certain neighborhood, and you didn't have a certain level of education, and you didn't attend the right college, well, you still aren't really one of us. Ooh, oh, I hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings on that. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He gave of himself. See, these are his things. It didn't come free. He was willing to put himself out and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He set him on his own animal. What he gave that man is something we usually need a whole lot of our own self. You know what he did? There's no way, I don't think he was strong enough to just pick him up like that. He had to give him what? What are we good for in this church? Hugs. He had to give a man a hug and set him up on his animal because there's a lot of times in our lives that our neighbors need our hugs. How often do we need hugs? We're all neighbors. Like Marlon said earlier, we're all family. Whether it's your first time here or not, we're all family. We all need those hugs. We We all need that acceptance. We all need that love that Jesus has given out. We need to love our neighbors as ourselves. See, as ourselves, we want other people to treat us the way we would like to be treated. The Bible says that if you want to have friends, you need to be friendly. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, And whatever more you spend when I come, I will repay you. Two denarii. It doesn't sound like much. Two denarii at that time was two full days wages. Here is a Samaritan. You may read about the the guy that was there actually was a Jew, and he was willing to go ahead and give two days of his wages to help this one who was in need. See, that Samaritan, he must have heard some good stuff during his life because he had had some religion that wasn't polluted, but he was a hearer, but he was also a seer and a doer. Brothers and sisters, we need to keep our eyes open when we look around sometimes with our church family or in our own family and you see people that really look down and despondent or struggling or you know they're struggling, you can see it in their faces. Do we say, you know what, I really don't have time to get involved with that. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to ask them how things are going. Now, I know there's exceptions to every rule. I had this individual in my life um, at one time that very, very fond of, and whenever you asked her how she was doing, you better have 30 minutes or so. <laughs> but it was always good to be patient and listen. So he gave of his own self, and he told the innkeeper, you know what, whatever it takes, do it, and I'll be coming back for him. You know, brothers and sisters, that's the compassion that Jesus has for us. He has has helped us with our wounds. He has answered our prayers. He has helped us through difficult times, right? And you know what, he's coming back for us as well, and he'll make everything right. He will redeem us. We choose him when he gets back. When he gets back. Now Jesus has told his story to the lawyer. And the lawyer has heard this and he knows in his heart his question was answered. Because he asked, he put it out there, who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus just answered that. Showing what it is to be a disciple of Christ. What it is to be a a disciple of God, what it is to have love for God and have love for one another. When you're willing to put yourself out there for someone else, whether you know them or not, 
whether they're even accepted by you or not. Because you have that love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. Now Jesus says, he, who, oh, he says, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Now listen to the lawyer's answer. And he said to him, he showed mercy on him. He said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. In the commentary it said, you know, that even then the, the lawyer couldn't call the Samaritan by name because... There was so much prejudice in his heart, and he knew that he has to deal with this. Brothers and sisters, we struggle with a lot in this world. We do, and we know we do. We know that prejudice is a reality. And we know that we hear things all the time. It was a time when I felt like we were really getting over the hump in this. We were really coming together, but then we see more and more where it's not. But you know what I realize? And some people may disagree with me on this one. But there is not as much prejudice as it used to be. Yes, we hear all the negative stuff. They don't never put the good stuff in the news. And brothers and sisters, I believe in our churches today that we're overcoming this, not by our, our power, because we can get power through Jesus Christ. And there's no reason for us to have barriers. And I believe in my heart that these barriers are coming down and we're becoming more and more one in Jesus Christ. I believe that. No matter what's outside those walls and all the stuff that goes on, and there's a lot of problems, when we have Jesus in our life, we're getting through these things. So let's not get discouraged. Let's not get discouraged. Several months ago, I was involved in an amazing discussion. A discussion that I needed to be a part of. And it had to happen with why we were having such a difficult time getting over this hump, coming together as people. Especially as blacks and whites, if that's any better way to put it. And how in the world can we not be progressing better than what we are doing? Why is there still so much distance between us in some areas? This, I was motivated, I feel like, by the Holy Spirit because I had a, there was a group of people there, deeply spiritual people there. People that I knew that if I asked this question, they wouldn't look down upon me for asking, that I could find out why. Because this, this is something that I wrestle with. Lord, how come we're not making more progress in this? Are we ever going to come together? And I asked the question, and I knew it, and, and we talked about it and talked about it, but you know what, the answer just didn't come. And I knew the answer wasn't coming, but it wasn't anybody's fault that the answer wasn't coming, but it just didn't come. And finally, there was a young man there. And he says, I know what you're asking now. You're asking, how come we can't have it now like it's going to be when we get to heaven? And I said, that's it. That's exactly what I want to know. And he shared with me something that changed the way I thought and helped me tremendously, and I'm sharing it with you today. He says, we're trying, but the pain runs so deep. And brothers and sisters, then I understood. Yes, we are working hard to come together, but in some things the pain runs real deep, and it's not that easy to get over. And the Lord put on my heart, and again, I'm bearing some things to you, but really is the truth, and I came to know myself a little bit better, but understanding what's going on. I can watch, especially documentaries sometime, and see where people are being mistreated, and you know, in history. Terribly mistreated. Terrible atrocities. And it stirs up something inside of me. And it wasn't me happening to. But does it change the way I feel? Absolutely. And i got to go into prayer. Lord, where is this all its emotion coming from? So pain runs deep. So we just got to be patient with one another and realize that these walls are coming down, but we're working on this together. Because we have the love of Jesus Christ. That's what we have. 
And the devil is not going to win. He is already lost, and we will all come together. Let's just be patient with one another. Because we're all working together. We can't control what goes on out there. We can help. But inside these walls, brothers and sisters, we can do a whole lot better. And we are doing a whole lot better. Don't let the devil discourage you and tell you anything different. We are all one in Jesus Christ, each and every one of us. That's the message that Jesus, in the plan of salvation, he came here to show us to have the love of God and have this love for one another. And brothers and sisters, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. Can't wait till Jesus comes back. Let's bow our head for prayer. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, again, thank you so much for your written word. Thank you for the answers and the solutions to problems. Thank you for having neighbors and friends and family and people to love. What an amazing emotion, God, that you've given us. And God, you are love. I pray that you will help us to be patient and understanding with one another to treat each other as we'd like to be treated, to recognize every person on this planet as a neighbor, worthy of attention, worthy of conversation, worthy of help. Thank you. We pray for this world, Father, that uh, this world needs tremendous healing, and we know that this complete healing will take place when Jesus returns, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.